Many people may be familiar with EB1, EB2, EB3. The EB in these numbers all means employment-based. And the grades one, two, and three show the different levels of merit and specialty, specializations and expertise uh, for the employment base. So for EB1, you might see extraordinary abilities, Einstein visa, they're called, or outstanding researchers or CEOs and multinational managers. So that, that really is like top of the field, top of their careers. EB2 are people with advanced degree holders and whose jobs in the US would require advanced degrees. And EB3 are skilled workers and other workers people who require at least a bachelor's or some seasonal workers and, and unskilled workers. So as you can see, there are these different gradations. Uh, I'm here to talk about EB-5 because it's kind of an odd duck in this entire strata. Uh, if we can see the talking points, please. Um, EB-5, it is technically employment based. It is technically employment based, but it is not so much you becoming an employee uh, so much as you coming to America and investing in America and making a sizable contribution to the American economy to create employees. Uh, and so I'll just go through this. It, it's, it's a potential solution. And right now it's time sensitive too, because there's special treatment if you are already in the US or if you can get to the US on a valid status like student or, or, or H-1B. Uh, and if you can consider an EB-5 immigration, for a limited time, there is no waiting list for any country in EB-5 going forwards. And so I'll talk a little bit more about that. But the exciting news about that is that if you do qualify for EB-5, you could actually file and file for adjustment of status at the same time. And that locks in your eligibility to remain in the USA while the USCIS is processing your case. So without further ado, uh, EB-5 investment immigration, Last year, we had a very dramatic bill called RIA, the Reform and Integrity Act, and that tidied up quite a few definitions. It changed quite a few uh, small details about EB-5, and most importantly, it created a few new categories for EB-5 investments that have top priority. These ones do not have any long waiting lists yet. Uh, some may appear. Um, but we'll go through them and we'll uh, go through more options for investors, especially for those who are currently in the USA. So EB-5 is an unusual uh, employment-based category. Anybody who's been considering perhaps working for a U.S. company or perhaps starting your own U.S. company for EB-1 or EB-2 or 3, you might be aware that the U.S. company is the one who controls the attorney. It is the U.S. company who files the petition before USCIS. Not so for EB-5. Here, it is you, the foreign investor, who self-petitions. So you control the attorney, you control the I-526 or I-526E petition before the USCIS, the petition cannot be stopped without your permission. Uh, so this is resoundingly flexible. It's resoundingly favorable. Um, there have been rare but regrettable uh, situations where a person has gone through the EB-2 process. And then when it's already mature, the employer has perhaps a, a hiring freeze or they have adverse economic conditions. And they come back and they say, we're terribly sorry. We have to cut you from our workforce and we can no longer proceed with the EB-2 or EB-3. Not so with the EB-5. You are the one who makes the investment. You're the one creating the jobs for American economy. And so you are the one who hires a lawyer and controls the process. You cannot be cleaving aside from your own process. So that's a big win if you consider EB-5. Um, the process is also lengthy as EB-2 and EB-3 might be. Um, it requires the initial form I-526 or E depending on what flavor of EB-5 investment you want to do. You can file the adjustment status if there's no waiting list. Currently, as we mentioned, there is no waiting list, so more on that later. Uh, a few years afterwards, after the Immigration Service has reviewed your promise to create 10 jobs, and they think that your 526 or 526E is credible, they'll approve it. What does that get you? Well, that gets you the ability to adjust status if you're in the US or to show up and apply for consular processing at a US embassy or consulate. And that will get you an immigrant visa that gives you two years of conditional green card, conditional lawful permanent residency. And now the two years is not uh, 
it, it is not two years and then you're out, but it is two years to say you may come to America and oversee your investment, work, study, or not work or not study as you please. But at the end of those two years, the USCIS expects you to then file the I-829 removal of conditions. And that is a chance for the USCIS to say, well then, Mr. Investor or Ms. Investor, have you fulfilled your promise to really create 10 full-time jobs in the U.S. economy? So it's kind of like a two-step process. Number one is, here is my plan. Here is my promise to create this amount of jobs with this amount of money. And then at the 829 stage, they say, very good. Please prove this to us. Please give us a documentation to show that your plan has created 10 jobs. And if they then approve the 829, you then get a permanent green card. And as all permanent green cards, this is the document card itself is valid for 10 years and it can be renewed indefinitely. And there are no further limitations. You may stay here. You, you may eventually convert to citizenship if such is your wish. So then what are the EB-5 investment requirements? Now, um, I'll start off by this by saying that unlike EB-1 and EB-2 and EB-3, there is actually surprisingly few biographic requirements about you, the investor. Uh, you don't have to prove a PhD or master's or, or even bachelor's. You don't have to prove any academic uh, achievements. You don't have to prove that you're the top percent in your field, in your country, or in your community. Uh, you do not even need to prove, strictly speaking, that you speak English. There is no language requirement for EB-5. Um, instead, it is purely focused on your investment of a minimum amount of money and the promise, the credible promise of job creation. And so we have these details here that um, you must have a minimum amount of investment, which is generally seen as 1.05 million, 1 million and 50,000 after 2022. Before that, it was 1 million flat. Uh, that has now been closed off and you now need that extra 50,000 on top. Uh, if you invest in certain areas, then you may reduce this amount to 800,000. And this $800,000 amount may be more within the reach of CEOs, private business entrepreneurs, uh, or even people who have successfully speculated in real property. We do see a pattern with uh, countries such as mainland China, where the government has recently relaxed rules on private property ownership. And so then suddenly a few apartments that you own, the price skyrockets, and that is uh, a respected and valid way of proving lawful source. But you do have to show documentation. The US government does expect to see documentation that the funds are lawfully sourced. And then uh, where does this money go? It will go into a business inside US territory, a for-profit business, so it cannot be a charity, certainly cannot be you establishing your own household and saying, I'm going to hire 10 staff. That will, simply won't do. But it, it is something that will create jobs and engage in economic activity. Now, the two flavors of EB-5 are quite important. It is either now called a standalone, where you have the plan and you are managing it, or into a regional center. And the regional center is a convenient process that, that delegates a lot of the drudgery of the job creation record and a lot of the job uh, hiring. Um, and it also allows for pooling of EB-5. So say if there's 10 friends who want to gather, uh, get together and invest their 1.05 million or 800,000, they have to do the regional center model. They cannot do a pooled standalone that is categorically disallowed. So the use, uh, what does the American society get out of this? Well, they get 10 full-time jobs for qualified employees for at least two years. You are expected to create the 10 jobs and they must last for at least two years. Otherwise, they're considered temporary jobs. And you also need to have a credible business plan to do this. Now, if you do a standalone investment, which is our, our next slide, thank you so much. Um, if you do a standalone investment, that is the romantic and historically very common notion of an immigrant with a briefcase and a plan in their head and business plans uh, in their briefcase coming to America and with the money lawfully sourced. And they're saying, I'm going to open up a new hotel or I'm running a successful factory for parts in my home country, and I want to start uh, a franchise in America, or I want to stand, start a branch in America that distributes these or produces these and ships them back, and I need factory workers, I need hotel workers. So that is standalone, um, and that is, uh, 
your own for-profit business plan inside the U.S., you would then be responsible for deciding whether or not you are in the targeted employment area. That's if you want the 800000 If you want the $1.05 the the normal level, this is fine anywhere. But if you want the discount, then you'll need to handle the TEA calculations, which can be quite finicky. Um, and simply put, TEA is a certain definition of rural area or a certain definition of high unemployment area. And the responsibility for making sure that you're doing business there and creating jobs there then devolves to you. So you would have to make sure that you're looking at the relevant census tracts. Your lawyer can help you. Your business plan drafter can help you. But it falls on your shoulders. And if there's unfortunately a mistake or a misunderstanding, then the immigration service will come calling you or emailing you and saying, hello, please explain this discrepancy to us. So uh, the responsibility goes to you. And then also the job creation, uh, managing the business to create those 10 full-time jobs, that would also fall upon your shoulders. Not a problem for many people if they're already in America, if they already have that briefcase of plans and briefcase of money. Um, but for some people, they prefer a more hands-off approach. And that is where the EB-5 regional center investment category comes in. Now, a regional center is kind of a, a definition of art. Um, immigration service says that if a company wants to define themselves as a regional center, there is a certain form they can file and there's a certain two or three years long process that they go through. And then U.S. immigration then says, very well, we've reviewed your documents. We have given you this label stamp of regional center. So that two or three year uh, period of time, that's fairly significant. Um, it is theoretically possible for a person to create their own regional center, but it's probably not feasible, especially if you're in America and if you want to file as soon as possible. The good news is that there are hundreds. At the last count, I think there's more than 700 regional centers already certified in America that have already done business for years under the previous EB-5 uh, uh, label. And these regional centers are usually very happy to take on new affiliations. So if you have a plan and if you've got several buddies who want to do EB-5 pooled investment with you, then you can contact a regional center. Your lawyer can contact a regional center and sign up under them. Uh, oftentimes, there'll be a licensing fee. More than that, some regional centers also run their own off-the-shelf pick-and-choose projects. So if you want to delegate much of the drudgery and headache and logistics of the area selection and the job creation, you can actually find a regional center who has their own projects that may have some or all of their funding for the project for development coming from EB-5. And so that is very much like a subscription. Usually there's not much flexibility in how it's run. The, the, the project already knows how it wants to build this new shopping mall or build this mixed office and commercial and residential building. Um, but it will be some sort of very large project. Um, it will often be with people who have a lot of experience in developing. And so you can review their track record. So that's added consolation, added uh, reassurance. And uh, the regional center then takes care of things like handling TEA. They can have their economist experts and their financial experts review the census tract and say, yes, this is rural, or yes, this is a high unemployment census tract. And they can also manage the business of hiring people, getting boots on the ground and hard hats in the construction area, or even uh, white collar workers behind office desks to fulfill that quota of 10 full-time jobs of two years duration for each investor. Uh, one other small benefit for EB-5 regional centers is that they can use what's called econometrics to calculate job creation. And that's a special um, uh, advantage that the USCIS, the Immigration Service, has granted to regional centers. That you can have money in, however many tens or hundreds of millions come in, and then money out how much they spend. And they can then calculate that uh, in the abstract to say that in this area, this amount of money spent, therefore means this number of direct jobs, this number of indirect jobs, and so forth. Why is that significant? Well, that's significant because in a standalone investment, you can't really do that. Uh, in a standalone investment, you are required to be one man or one woman and one plan and 
creation of 10 documented workers. So you need to be able, really have their names, their social security numbers, their W-2s, and, and so on and so forth. So that's kind of a difference between the two. Number one, the standalone is great if you have your own plan and how you want to run things and you're confident in your ability to do so. And number two is more, say, you're here on an F1 student visa or you're here doing H-1B. You have some other status that is taking up your time and you're focusing on that but you would like to reserve open the future prospect of getting a green card a few years from now and your money, uh, you, you have your lawfully sourced income and you want to make your money work for you, but you don't want to get your hands into the details of running an everyday service. So here's a timeline or, or here's a process rather of the EB-5 uh, process, you would need to prove that you've got lawfully sourced funds. And so your lawyer would work with you probably a step one to do this, uh, because you don't want to get further on down the timeline and realize, oh, crumbs, I've, I've, I've got this one transaction that seems uh, insufficiently documented. So then you want to make sure that your lawfully sourced funds are proven. Then you put the funds into the business, whether it's your own mom and pop shop or your own hotel, uh, or it's into a regional center uh, funded project. Then you file your I-526 if you're running your own business, or you file the I-526E if you're with a regional center. The differences are not terribly large. Uh, then you can adjust status if you are inside the US on a valid non-immigrant status and if there's no waiting list for your nation. This is a novelty. This is probably the most important takeaway from my speech today. If there's anything else that you remember, please remember this. Uh, EB-5 has been around since 1990. So that's a good 33 years. And all since the beginning, EB-5 did not allow you to file your 526 and the adjustment status. They said, no, you must wait until your 526 has been approved. And then if you're in the USA, you may file 485. Well, the US government has given us a treat in 2022. And they have said that if you are filing an EB-5 going forwards, and there's no waiting list for your country of birth, you may also file a 485 for adjustment of status. And the rule is universally that a properly filed adjustment of status allows you to remain lawfully in the United States, and you may also file for a re-entry permit or advanced parole, 131, and you may also file for an employment authorization document, 765. Well, suddenly this opens up a very broad frontier, as you can imagine, for foreigners in America looking to make a new life in America and looking to contribute to American workforce and looking to contribute to the American economy, and also perhaps wanting to be able to go back home and do business plans there or meet with their family, it really opens up um, a much greater reward incentive for somebody here who's already a student or already a worker on a non-immigrant status to say, well, great, if I do EB-5 in the future, I will get a benefit, but also I can remain here and oversee my investment. So this is a, a golden opportunity and um, I'll talk a little bit more about the waiting list uh, a little later. But uh, right now, the fact is before us today that if you file an I-526 or an I-526E, then you can also file the adjustment of status. And that pending adjustment of status lets you put eventually uh, leave and re-enter the US validly. And it allows you to work or not work in the US as you please. But that's a, a rather lengthy editorial aside. Back to this timeline. Um, once the I-526 has been approved, if the investor is outside of the U.S., then they can start the DS-260 consular processing. And that's the uh, process that I happily oversaw when I was in Guangzhou, China for three years uh, in my office overlooking the U.S. consulate. At that time, it was the uh, global ground center, you could say, for EB-5 investor uh, immigrant visas because the majority of the applicants were all from China. Um, consular processing will get you an immigrant visa stamped in your passport, or if you're already in the U.S. and you have not already done so, then uh, the I-485 adjustment status can be filed at that time. Um, then that gives you the two-year conditional lawful permanent residency, or the conditional green card. You may come to America. You will do all the things that green card holders do in America. You'll file taxes to the US government. Um, you, you'll be allowed to work, be allowed to study, be allowed to live here and leave and re-enter. And then starting from 21 months after you've got that status, which is to say three months before the two-year anniversary, uh, you may and should 
file the I-829 removal of conditions. And this is the final step. And the 829 removal of conditions shows to the US government, Uncle Sam, I have promised you that I'll create 10 jobs. Here is my documentation to show that I created 10 jobs. Please remove the conditions uh, and uh, approve my green card process. These processes do take time. The I-526 uh, in its heyday, and uh, it's it's been a little skewed now because of COVID, but the I-526 took two years or more at that time, which is why at this time it's important if you're considering an I-526 and if you can get to America on a non-immigrant visa, it's a good idea to consider the AOS as well. So two years of I-526 or more, and then you get your two years of conditional green card, and that means two more years, so four years. Um, and during that time, you may live and reside in the US, and then you file the IA-29 removal of conditions. And that is, uh, in front of us right now, we're seeing that is actually taking four years. So two plus two, four plus another four years. So that's currently eight years. That having been said, the Biden administration did state in 2021 that they're adding an extra $400 million budget to the USCIS. And they did also say aspirationally they're trying to get processing times across the board, the median processing time across the board to about six months or so. And I'm sure Raju has also seen this. And, and uh, in many other categories, we are also seeing speeding up of these processes. So there is hope. We are cautiously optimistic that these times will reduce. Uh, but uh, it is a long-term end game with a current golden window that if you file the 526 or E at the same time as the AOS when you're in the US, that actually locks you in and lets you stay here while you wait. Uh, possible developments and synergies. Oops, here we go. Uh, for possible developments and synergies, uh, as I've already mentioned, there's currently no waiting list. Um, waiting lists may appear for high demand nations. Historically, we have seen waiting lists show up for China, mainland China, that is to say, not, uh, not Taiwan, not Hong Kong. Um, and uh, we have also seen waiting lists in the past for India and Vietnam, and there was a threatened waiting list for South Korea, which previously did not actually materialize. Um, but based on current visa usages, uh, a South Korean waiting list could potentially appear. What happens when a waiting list appears? Well, anybody who's in the system will then kind of take a ticket in line based on the day that they filed, not the date they're approved. So the earlier you file, the earlier you are on the waiting list. But another fairly important development is that once a waiting list appears for a nation, then anybody uh, who applies in future in that nation can no longer file for the AOS. So if you're here on an F1 or if you're here on an H1B and you're trying to file a 526 when a waiting list has already appeared, you cannot file an AOS. And so there is no immediate relief of saying, well, I've got my placeholder waiting in line for me. I can stay in the US. You would need to prolong your F1, prolong your H1B or prolong your other uh, non-immigrant status to allow you to lawfully stay in the US separate from the AOS because you could not file the AOS until the waiting list has been satisfied. Uh, another possible development, uh, many lawmakers are talking about what's called a recapture of the EB-5 quota. We are pushing that quite hard with many lobbying groups and uh, congressional information groups. Uh, what is this since 1990 until the present day? Um, many years of EB-5 uh, went by without any anywhere near the quota of 10,000 visas being used up. And so those quotas were just lost into the void. And um, there's currently a movement to say to Congress, look, we're not asking you to create more visas. We're asking you just to recapture all of those visas from 1990 till 2014, 2015 that were wasted, add them to, to uh, the, the current quota and allow more people to uh, do EB-5 quickly. Um, another issue, uh, EB-5 filing is an immigrant petition. So anybody who's here on an F1, you might be aware that there is a certain sensitivity about showing immigrant intent. So just keep that in mind that EB-5 does show immigrant intent. It could potentially have some effect on non-immigrant statuses. Uh, your immigration attorney or a skilled immigration attorney can work with you on that with timing and, and also with other aspects of that to help defray any possible effects. Uh, and the big one. For those of you who are from certain countries that have signed the treaty investor uh, bilateral treaty with the USA, the E2 status uh, is called the treaty investor status. It's a non-immigrant status, but it's very similar. 
to the EB-5. It, it is a temporary status that has to be renewed more or less every year or so. Um, and if you fail to renew it, then it expires, but it's fairly fast. So you can think of E2 as being a, a quick but temporary solution for somebody who wants to invest, and an EB-5 as being slow but permanent. And if you are from an E2 treaty investor country, you could consider one transaction that satisfies both if your attorney and your financial planners can help you plan the uh, details of such an investment. Unfortunately, the two most waitlisted countries, India and China, do not have E2 treaty investments, but Republic of China in Taiwan does. Um, I believe so too does Pakistan and many members of the EU and many members of uh, South America and Central America. So it's certainly worth looking into it. And uh, final crossover, the EB1C and L1A could potentially be a crossover with EB5. Uh, the uh, EB1C and L1A are basically for CEOs, board members, directors, uh, general managers, very high level corporate uh, people who are functioning in that role in a non-US company outside of the US. Uh, these people often also have very high compensation, and so they are able to potentially do an $800,000 or $1.05 million investment, and quite a few of them do do EB-5. Um, and so the L1A, EB1C, those could be a way to get you here quickly, and then the EB-5 could be a long-term way to uh, uh, get you a green card.